that I read to him every night, and he could read those read those books to me because he had to memorize, you know. So by the time he got into first grade, teachers telling me, you know, he's got some problems. They still aren't. This is back in the early 80s, so they're not they're not knowing too much about dyslexia. By, by the end of second grade, though, his, he went to school every day with a stomach ache, didn't want to even go to school. This is a kid that wanted to go to school, loved to learn, you know, when he first started, and he was just, he, he had just shut down. So in my, in our journey trying to find something for him, we came across a, a school, in, a private school in, um, not too far from us in Pleasant Hill, California, that was doing, um, working with students who were dyslexics. We had him tested. Lo and behold, he was tested. This is now he's nine years old. He tested as uh, dyslexic. She turned around and looked at my husband and said, would you like me to give you the, the screening? And he said, why not? So guess what? My husband was dyslexic. That was a big relief to him. So at the same time, she offered me a job. So I took the job and I've been working with dyslexic students and adults and training teachers for the last 20, almost 28 years. So I love it. I wouldn't go back to the regular classroom. I tried one year in a regular classroom when I first got here. It was supposed to be a sub job and it ended up being a long, all year sub job at <laughs> the private school. I just love our population. I love working with them. So, Today we're going to go through what is dyslexia, what does it look like, and then some ideas about how you can help those that you're working with or those that you come in contact with. And in your fold, and this this little pen, pen highlighter and sticky note thing is pretty cool, is from the Slingerland Institute for Literacy, who is the group that I do teacher training for. We do comprehensive uh, full course teach trainings that are four weeks long or in, in year training that is six, year, six weeks long. Um, it's an approach, it's not a curriculum, it's a teaching approach. Uh, we do short courses for reading and um, how to give the slinger on screening. We do um, short courses, introduction to how to teach reading, uh, writing in a multi-sensory method. Uh, the Slingerland approach is one of the internet, uh, it's one of the Orton Gillingham ap approaches, but it is um, varies from the Orton Gillingham approach in that it is create Beth Slingerland created it for the classroom and tutorial. She wrote she's the first one that wrote a curriculum, a test, and offered a course for te training teachers. It is an a multi sensory sequential teaching approach and you, I love it because you can use any curriculum with it. It's not a curriculum so that makes it really nice. So that's the approach that we use at the school and that's what I've done for years. So we're, I, what I've got in your folder are just black and whites of the PowerPoints with lots of room for you to write notes on so I just wanted to let you know we're just going to get started and then as we go I want to make it kind of informal so if you have questions as we're going through how much time Connie, do we want to do this? I think it's an hour. An hour so from now? Yeah. Okay so I better get going. Okay so what is dyslexia? It's a lifelong challenge that people are born with. Okay. It's neurological in nature and it runs in families and after 40 plus years in marriage, my mother-in-law keeps coming up with people on my husband's side of the family that she's pretty sure were dyslexic because of things that they did that she knew and my husband didn't say, so it comes from somewhere. Uh, some, some dyslexics are identified early, early and others later in life. And it really depends on the severity of the dyslexia. Dyslexia can be very severe the processing can be very severe, or it can be, if you have students that you're working with here that are you suspect might be dyslexic and they've never been formally identified as being a dyslexic, it's probably because 
their dyslexia is more moderate or in a in a in a more in, probably more in the um, auditory or the language organization for written language and or keeping your time the time sequence time space time thing going on. Uh, dyslexics are of average or above average in intelligence. Uh, dyslexia occurs among people of all eth economic and ethnic backgrounds. The International Dyslexia Association has chapters all over the world. So they have chapters all over the world. A language, it's a language processing disorder which can hinder reading, writing, spelling, and sometimes speaking. Get your words twisted, you can't think of a word. You know, everybody does that when we're tired or um, excited or we have a lot on our mind, but it, these are things that you, this area is something, especially these, the speaking, is something that you look at, is it um, pervasive? Is it something that you see continually, whether they're stressed or not, do people have a hard time do the people or the students you're around have a hard time finding uh, words for something and they use the word thing a lot? Okay. Misuse pronouns, all those kinds of things. Okay. According to the uh, National Institute for Child and Human Development, human both, as many as 15% of Americans have major problems with reading that are not a result of poor education. Some people put it as high as 20%. So if you're working in a normal classroom situation and you have, it's interesting, because the second grade I was in for a year, I had 20 students in there, and there were f at least four that I knew for sure were dyslexics. Just, I didn't screen them, I just knew. So that's about right. It is not, dyslexia is not the result of, a, of impaired vision. Um, overlays and things like that do help, but it, that isn't the cure, okay? They don't help. Uh, mo it's uh, most universal problem for dyslexia is the recognition and manipulation of symbols, especially letters and numbers in sequence. So it can go over into math and have problems that come out into math also. Uh, as a, it results in uh, impairment to learn, retain, and express information, all of those areas. So you can tell that if you've got a dyslexic that's made it this far in school and the pressure the amount of workload, everything that's going on. That's why so many times I have tested, when I was in California, I tested numbers of almost exiting high schools or beginning college students, um, screened them for dyslexia and were shocked that they were dyslexic because it's the increase of all those complex skills and how your brain has to manage it all. Um, you, dyslexics may have difficulty following directions, keeping track of possessions, time awareness, finding their way around without getting lost. I got one personal story about the time awareness. My son, our son is totally not, that is not his problem. He is so aware of time and he's very good at finding his way around the first year we were here, the first Christmas, he came here, and after driving around town with my sister to go shopping, he got in the car and did not get wet, lost. He went out driving by himself. That's just, he's got a good directional sense. My husband, on the other hand, is always late. Every clock in the house is five or ten minutes ahead. I got a clock shower for the clock, I mean, a clock for the shower. They have such things because he just gets in there and starts thinking and forgets what time it is. That almost sounds like ADHD. Well, ADHD. part of it is that you'll see that a lot of that is, but there's a similarity. Uh, there's a story that when Albert Einstein came and relocated to the United States, and I forget which university he was working for at the time, he could not 
find his way to the university. He couldn't even find his way using public transportation. They had to send a driver and car for him every day. Now, how do you like that? This guy, he certainly wasn't unintelligent, was he? <laughs> Dyslexic students benefit by receiving written language and reading instruction using a multi-sensory method of instruction that is also explicit and implicit. That means it's um, thought, it's got steps to it, it's thought out, there's steps built on it one by one, and also teaches to the intellect. The Slingerland approach is very scaffold when it starts, when we start teaching students with it no matter what age. And because we're teaching to the intellect, we want to start pulling away the scaffolding so they have to start thinking about what they're doing without all the props. But the props can be brought in if they need them. So that's, that's what the teaching to the intellect is. Okay, some famous dyslexics. We have Henry Ford, Tom, Thomas Edison, Albert Einstein, Alexander Graham Bell. We have some politicians and military leaders, Winston Churchill. Prince Charles, Robert Kennedy, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Franklin Roosevelt, and George W. Bush, all famous dyslexics. Entrepreneurs, Charles Schwab. Charles Schwab, I heard him speak at a uh, conference in Northern California once. He's from San Francisco. He said way before they had widespread knowledge on working with dyslexics, he taught himself, he taught himself how to read by reading comic books. That's pretty uh, up here to figure that out, isn't it? Bill Hewitt of Hewitt Packard. Um, Charles Branson heard an interview on uh, the movie Dyslexia in the Big Picture. Has anybody seen that? We have that. We're probably going to be doing another showing the school. Charles Branson, the billionaire from the UK that has Virgin Airlines and all the other one things, um, he just has this brain for knowing a, like an intuitive thing about businesses and how to get them going, but he surrounds himself with all of the people that know how to manage the money and do all that. He said, in the interview, he said he had a hard time understanding the difference between net and gross in the business. Obviously, that's a big deal when you have to. <laughs> so his, one of his people that works for him in the accounting drew on the chalkboard, drew a, like a line that there was an ocean, a bunch of little fish underneath, and then a net around some of the fish. And when he saw that, he got it. So he needed that visual <coughs> picture, and that's so... Uh, true, and Ted Turner is another one. Athletes, good old Nolan Ryan, anybody, anybody know a famous baseball player? Bruce Jenner, Terry Bradshaw, Magic Johnson. These are just a few. I mean, you could have pages full of A lot of artists and musicians that are dyslexic. And uh, my, both my husband and I's son are very creative. Ansel Adams. John Lennon, Charles Schultz, Leonardo da Vinci, Walt Disney, and Patricia Palacco. Palacco. She's a writer and an art she illustrates for children's books. Um, just incredible. Writers, can you imagine? Dyslexic writers. Mark Twain, Agatha Christie, John Gresham. Debbie McCombra, Judy Bloom, and Abby. And uh, I was reading uh, Debbie, a thing from Debbie McCombra that said she actually used to go to the library in the Seattle area, and Judy Bloom was working there at the time and got interested in writing from Judy Bloom who um, she found out was also dyslexic, so that kind of encouraged her that, gee, just because I'm dyslexic, I've got all these ideas on my head, there's gotta be a way to, to work it through and, and get going on it, so it's pretty interesting. 
entertainment, Tom Cruise, Whoopi Goldberg, Tom Smothers, Edward James Almos, Stephen J. Connell, Connell, Harry Anderson, Steven Spielberg just came out, came out of the closet <laughs> last year in an interview where he realized he was dyslexic and just realizing that, I guess he was test, he had himself tested, just realizing that his interview, did anybody see that interview? I think ABC, one of the ABC news shows covered it. You can Google it and find it on he said, what a relief it was for him to find out that there was a reason for why he'd struggled and it had nothing to do with his intelligence. It's pretty cool. Uh, Henry Winkler, Henry Winkler's actually written some books for young people, um, not quite adolescents, but not really, really young, on um, his experience, the character's experiences with dyslexia and Jay Leno, dyslexic. So those are some famous dyslexics. We could think of more, lots of people, but that's just a real encouragement for the kids we, we come in, people that we come in contact with. Here's some early symptoms. In childhood, difficulty expressing the oneself. Uh, delay in learning tasks such as tying shoes and telling time. That was my son didn't learn, couldn't learn how to tie that shoe till he was eight years old. They didn't have Velcro shoes then. I mean, just clicked for him. Still has trouble with the before time. Um, 15 minutes before nine. He still can't visually, he can't get that in his mind, what that looks like. He's 35. Uh, difficulty following verbal and or written directions uh, at a young, as a young child. That's pretty, uh, you've got a toddler that has trouble following verbal directions. It, see, some of these are the crossover with what Connie was saying with that ADD and my son and my husband are both ADD on top of it. That's the, that's, but that's not their primary, but it doesn't help because that's that weak executive function then. Uh, difficulty learning the alphabet, times tables, words, songs, or rhymes. Not all of those, but any one of those or a combination of. Okay, might have. A, rhyming is a real big one. I, when I do summer schools, I use, uh, we start with a song in the, before we start our lesson, and I always do Down by the Bay because it's rhyming and it really lets you see immediately what kids have auditory perception problems because they have a very difficult time finding a simple word to rhyme with the thing in the, in the in, is everybody familiar with that? Um, continuous mis mispronunciation of words. Um, a lot of times pe people that are dyslexic get their syllables parts of their syllables, like if they have trouble saying hangaber, hangaber, for hamburger. Uh, <laughs> you, get, you, get, you get consonants or parts mixed in. Uh, my son still has trouble saying fluorescent. He says fluorescent. He gets the L after the F, fluorescent. So, those persistent things. There was a, a reverend in England, Reverend Spoon, who had this problem, and they they coined the phrase Spoonerisms because of that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because he was notorious for it. It's before they knew all this stuff, but that's where that, if you hear anybody talk about Spoonerism, that's that word where they get a, con a consonant that gets in the wrong place in the word. And it gets, and when it's, pers again, it's persistent. All young kids, all young children have problems pronouncing some words, but when it's persistent and it goes beyond what they should be doing at their age level. Clumsiness, poor playground skills. Uh, large motors sometimes can be. Avoidance of coloring, pencil or crayon activities. That was where my son's also dysgraphic and that was starting to come. Pencil or crayon held awkwardly. Difficulty learning to read. That's probably the one everybody most associates with dyslexia. Mixing the order of letters, I suppose to say or, 
or numbers while writing. Uh, inattentiveness and distractibility. And the reason, how many people were at Monday night? Okay, the reason, now I can talk about this, the reason that this becomes an issue is not always, an, not always an attention problem, but think about how your brain felt after an hour and a half of doing what you had to do. And when a student who's dyslexic, especially severely dyslexic, is in the classroom for an hour and a half, this is why they start feeling like this. Some even after 45 minutes, some after 20 minutes. So this is why, because that executive front, your brain is tired, it's just tired, and your brain's response is to fidget. That's your brain's uh, subliminal or natural response. Is your body starts fidgeting to, and doing things to help to try and keep you alert. So we think of that as being distractible or inattentive. Um, they are also slow finishing a given amount of work. They may become too confused to perform adequately in the middle of pressure, <coughs> ladies. <laughs> that group, that last group, you knew that you felt like that. They, and then they become unwilling to take risks because of repeated failure. The people in my reading group in the last session, you didn't even want to try. You didn't want to try because you just knew you were going to be wrong. And that's, that's sad because Think of the inventors that we looked at. Thomas Edison and all of those guys. I mean, how many times did Thomas Edison fail before he actually got a working incandescent light bulb? Yes? I have a question about the pencil and crayon being held properly <coughs> and avoiding coloring and drawing. Mm -hmm. um, if, if a child has a lot of um, motor skill difficulties in other areas, then does it still apply to this? Or is it only if they have fine motor skill they have normal fine motor skills with other things, but not with pencils and crayons. And am I making any sense? Yeah. So yeah, you've got the right dish. Fine motor. Did they have good mm -hmm. fine motor in other areas, but not with this? Or can it be all around fine no, motor? No, it can be not with this and other things. For example, because when you hold a pencil, there's a nerve that goes, whichever hand you hold, there's a nerve that comes here. And it goes all the way back to your back of your neck to the area where your uh, large motor is. And then that patterns up to where it's supposed to be up here. So holding a pencil, it's not just holding the pencil. It's having to get the print or the crayon and make your hand do it a certain way. Stay within a lines if you're coloring, stay within lines if you're writing, and that's what becomes difficult. It's not like taking and building with Legos, which is also a fine motor. Okay. My son, our son is an artist, or he has the artistic ability. He took art in his junior year in school, and never, he had a hard time finishing everything because of his dysgraphia. He could see it in here. And he, he had, his pieces were, his, his self-portrait was absolutely incredible. But it took him three times longer than everybody else because of his fine motor. And, but building, he loved to build with his Legos and he could come up with all kinds of stuff. So that fine motor is different than pencil paper. Okay. And, be, and it's also because of the spatial thing. So that's why, thank you for asking. May I ask a question uh -huh. here? We did a lot of um, kindergarten age brain gym mm -hmm. and found that students who, you know, are having difficulty with some of those areas, you could hand them a ball, Absolutely. they would also have trouble. Mm -hmm. And so mastering the two, because helping the brain learn that cross right. lateral. Right, and the cross lateral is really the key. Brain gym is really good. We had a, at New Vistas, where I first started all this, the school that hired me, we had our kindergarten first grade teacher was trained in all of that before it became brain gym she'd take her kids out to the parking lot and they would walk as best as they could they would walk the line and do a lot of and and do say their ABCs they do other things she had them doing the, their their addition facts whatever count by twos count by fives while they were doing a lot of this the crossover stuff while they were doing it so 
because that helps with reading mm -hmm. and absolutely other therapeutic finders. Absolutely. Yeah, so. I don't want to take up too much of your time. No, no, no. Question. That was a, when you said about the nerve going up, that made alarm bells go off in my head. Do they sometimes not want to put that down on the table because of that? I mean, cause yeah, my because you can't put his arm down there. You've like got to hold your, get a fatter pencil. I don't yeah. care how old they are. Fat pencil works and do it. And a fatter pencil, down. yeah. And okay. get the, they've got to hold their pencil at the right angle and everything. We can, we can talk afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Develops the I don't care. <coughs> on the other. Lose it. Uh, maybe labeled lazy, messy, and stupid. How many people? Lazy, messy, stupid. That was our son. They, and they also developed that I don't care attitude. Not completing their homework. You know? In adolescents and adults, they high, high intelligence but poor reading skills. Repeated errors such as letter or word reversals, leaving off the ends of words when they're reading, especially those suffixes. And then that goes to comprehension. Poor spelling. Uh, problems with writing, either using, holding the pen or pencil. I mean, it just aches me that a high schooler, that if I work with high schoolers, they get into my class and they're still, they're holding their pencil like this and nobody has tried to correct it when it was easier when they were first and second grade to get rid of that habit. Try to get rid of that with a high schooler or a college. Could that uh, also express itself in trouble uh, in speech problems? I mean, not just finishing a sentence or yes. whatever, but the way they pronounce their yes, words. Yes, absolutely. We're doing um, pronouns, reviewing pronouns at the high school, and uh, objective, we're doing, we were reviewing the, the pronouns with self and selves at the end, and we're going through the list, and one of the boys said, he, his sentence had something with themselves at the end. He, he, he says, that doesn't sound right. It should be their selves. And the other two boys are going, but that was his auditory perception. That has always how he's heard that. It's always how he's heard it. So I had to break that off and show him how to change it if the if it was not their cell themselves and it was just them and gave the ball to them, would he would it say would that make sense? Yeah, you would say there. They gave anyway. But he still insisted that it sounded it sounded better, see, he's to go on by what it sounds. I have to tell the story too, because we're talking about when I first the first couple of years I was of the first year I was at Austin Coley, one of the boys really strong East Texas really strong East Texas school. The other two of the students don't, this boy does. So I've got a decoding list of A, A, uh, A I words in, in part of them, and H A I L. So he gets up, underlines H A I L, says A, reads the word hell. He looks at me and says, Mrs. Springer, you put a bad word on the list. <laughs> I said, Will, go back and read it slowly. Oh, hail. It's not L, not L. And I teach the kids that L and the R like to control, but just a, we're talking about pronunciation and hearing. So that's, that's one of those. And regionally, you get into those regional things. And then that's why the students have trouble uh, spelling, because they aren't hearing things correctly. OK, and so if you're working with foreign students, that can be also the same thing. We're going to talk, we'll just slip that in here right now. I've actually worked with a couple of students when I was at Redwood um, Christian High School before I moved, who were um, from Hong Kong, first language man, 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 Cantonese, coming into my class because they passed the English entrance exam, but they had no functional use of English. <laughs> so they're with me for a year. But yeah, just the font phonetic teaching and phonetic way of t 
teaching helps our, if you do it, it works the same. It helps to learn the English language. So if you work with those kind of students or are interested, see me, I'll tell you about it. Um, difficulty finishing, <coughs> oh, difficulty, this is this, this is a big one in college because you've got all that written stuff. Even if you type, it, it doesn't, if you, you can type 100 words a minute, but if you can't organize your thoughts into a, a manner that's going to be legible and readable and make sense to somebody, it doesn't make, make, make any difference. So difficulty finishing long tests and assignments on time. Well, those of you who were at the simulation know why the tests might be a problem. The long assignments getting finished on time, there's a lot of factors for that, but a big one is the organizational skills that need to be there and that are weak. Learning how to manage their time, learning how to get everything down. Confusion with directions, left, right, up, down. Confusion with time, clocks, calendars. Um, okay, this is our global development of normally acquired language. Love this chart. So we start with uh, understanding and speaking as as children, as babies. They start understanding the words and then they repeat. Okay, so we have <clears throat> this understanding and speaking. It requires an auditory stimulus. In other words, they're here, they're listening to mom or dad or whoever um, for the output and input. Okay, so that concept serves as the fundamental basis for verbalized instruction or expression. So once a baby learns, they hear, hear, hear first time they say mama or dada or whatever they say, everybody goes, ah, well that's that verbalized expression. And that's what most of the world was doing for thousands of years was this. Very few people were doing this. They paid people to do this for them. So in, as a result, our auditory memories were outstanding because that was the main source of how we kept information, okay? So this is uh, understanding and speaking then becomes part of what we use for reading. There's a visual stimulus for the input. So when I teach reading, what the be beginnings of reading, I, we work on the letter sound symbols first, including writing them, and as I'm teaching them how to write them, I'm showing them, this is the letter L, the keyword is lamp, it's L, or L, L, lamp, ol, and they say that, and we're doing, it's the multi-sensory, so we're putting all of that together. Um, it, translates into written expression and reading also translates into written expression. So I realized as I began working with our population, um, I'm a good reader, I've always been a good reader. Um, writing was a little bit more difficult for me, just getting, finding the words. I knew the words, I, it, it was just finding those words. So I may have had a little bit of a language, expressive language, um, disability. I can remember in eighth grade going to the school psychologist and I, my mom said, if you're going to the school psychologist, they're going to give you some tests to see if, they, if you're ready to skip a grade. Well, I know I, fly, I, I <coughs> paced through everything except this auditory, I'll never forget it, an auditory test where she gave me a word and asked me to tell her what the word meant in my own words, not write it, to say it. And it, it was like, in my head I could see it, I could see the words, but I couldn't get it out of my mouth. Enough times where they felt that wasn't it. But I realize now later, years later, after working with our kids, I probably have a little bit, at that time, a little bit of expressive language problem. Not necessarily dyslexia, because there's other spectrums, but things you learn about yourself. <laughs> Um, but 
I said that because I love to read. I read, 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 and I know that that has helped me with my written expression. It's helped me with my spelling because I have a really good visual memory. My auditory memory isn't as strong, but my visual memory is really strong. So I know because of the amount of reading that I do and have done, that helps here. On the other hand, kids and people that have good verbal expression, like my husband, not my son, but my husband, if he could write, he would probably have better a better flow of what he's expressing, especially about interpersonal things, than I would. Um, so that wa is why technology today is so great. We're getting him um, Dragon Speak Naturally for his laptop because he's finally ready for it. All these years I've been talking to him, but he's finally ready for it. He wants to do it because he's got all of these things in his head that he wants to say in writing which is wonderful because he is, my son's pediatrician that um, di worked with us um, said to him, and actually diagnosed him as being ADD, said to him one day, talking to you people would never know that you had a severe reading and learning disability because you talk so above whatever. So technology in that sense is a freeing thing for someone that has a gift verbally and wants to do this. Okay, so, but you can see they all work hand in hand. So the Slayerlin approach is like, um, you start out really heavy with the learning to write side that strengthens that motor kinesthetic thing. Then, then it goes down into the reading reading and the written language side, kind of like a triangle. The more, once they get automatic up here, the triangle flips, you spend very little time in the reviewing the letters and you spend more time on the concepts. So you spend a little time on decoding, but you spend a lot of time on, on the um, reading side of concept development and vocabulary development and all of those things that make reading wonderful and rich. And then that translates over to the writing side also. So um, it's a very interesting little diagram that she's got there. So the result is a complete auditory visual kinesthetic language function, which goes to our brain. This is the way your brain is organized. Yours isn't as easy and it's not pretty, sorry. <laughs> um, <coughs> on the right side of your brain, I mean, on the left side of your brain, you have writing, language, science, all your logic, your, that, these kinds of um, skills, writing, language, skill, scientific skills, mathematics, lists, logic, they're all housed on the left side, that's the linear thinking mode. On the left, the right side of your brain is your emotional expression, your spatial awareness, that's why there's so many people that are artists or musicians or those types of people that seem to be dyslexic. That's not saying, but think of the scientists that we saw. They were scientists that were creating new ideas and they were thinking outside of the box and they weren't really even thinking. Einstein's theory is certainly not a linear idea, is it? It's really more of a big picture, holistic idea. So those kinds of scientists are the ones that really accept creativity, imagination, dimension, um, the whole picture when you look at the gestalt. And it really doesn't have anything to do with your right, whether you're right hand or left hand, if you're going to have a problem. That's just showing you that the right hand, the left side of the brain controls the right hand, and the left side hand, uh, right hand controls the left. And um, there was a doctor that worked at Johns Hopkins in the 90s and into the early, and I couldn't find his research anywhere, Dr. Galliburi. He did, um, he was a pathologist and he was doing research on um, dyslexic brains. And 
learning that a dyslexic's brain is equal or larger on the right side than a, than a non-dyslexic brain because of the language pathways um, going on both sides of the hemisphere instead of primarily on the left side, left side. Um, where they should, where it should go. So a dyslexic, this is where it comes in, this is the frontal lobe, so it's supposed to, the language pathways are supposed to be on this side, and you go, uh, I couldn't get any of the neat brain pictures to load up on my, with the brain scans imaging, to load on my PowerPoint, but you can email me and I'll send you some links if you want. Um, the language side is supposed to be building in over here, but in a dyslexic's brain without the proper reorganization methods with the multi-sensory, a lot of it goes over here and it gets lost. It's not that it's not in your brain, it's just not in the right spot. So it's wandering around in this spot and it's building this side larger. Do I make sense? Okay. So that's that was very interesting. I'll never forget listening to a him speak at the first um, International Dyslexia Association meeting. I think it was in the early 90s, but it was quite interesting. Um, I have some websites just for information, and then we can talk about specifics. So you've got this page. It's a little bit easier to read than my PowerPoint slide, because this came when I tried to print it, because I had to make it smaller. It was really small. So, these are some really good websites for articles, more information. Um, the, this one, the National <coughs> Center for Learning Disabilities, has some good um, information, and so does the International Dyslexia Association for different apps and programs that you could find applications for, especially if you have iPads, that seems to be the big thing. Um, iPads seem to have more apps for helping, um, but there's some good applications that you can get there. Um, just a lot of good information. The Dyslexic Advantage is uh, a really good website for information about people who have made it. And are, they have a wonderful book called The Dyslexic Advantage, and it's people they've worked with and people they've interviewed, that, the two authors that have that are dyslexic and they're, the strengths, they talk about the strengths of the dyslexic mind and then the, the weaknesses. They don't focus on the weaknesses first, they talk about the strengths, so it's, it's a good book. And then the Shaywitzes, uh, Sally and her husband, Dr. Uh, Shaywitzes, are at the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity. That's a good, another good one for information. So I want to address specifics that you have more than just talking generally about what you can do. I think that would be more helpful. So people working here, what are some specific questions you have about working with the population that you work with, how, can, how you can help them? Well, I have a question from when we met on Monday, where they were, and you had mentioned today too, that sometimes later in life they could actually be identified, or they can go through, mm -hmm. and, and you know, so we may have college students that may right. struggle with this, but they may not be aware. No, and I do a screening, uh -huh. just like these screening. So if you want to talk to me more about that, I can. It's very good. What it does is it. It's a series of activities that um, first two tests are strictly um, visual, discrim not discrimination, spatial, like far point, near point, copying. So it's spatial orientation on the page from what you're doing. The next page is a, the short-term visual memory with no writing, just recognizing, pulling up and recognizing what was on a card and circling to test your short-term visual memory. Next one is short-term or uh, visual discrimination, which means you are matching something that's at the top of the column with something underneath and you're at a time crunch. So it's that time thing that really they don't know it, but they act like they are. I never tell people they're on a timer, but it's about a minute for college level. So it's basically, can they scan information accurately? Because that's what, what you have to do at that level to get through. Um, and it, it tests all the different modalities, the 
which you use when you're learning. Um, and then we see whether there's a persistence of reversals, transpositions, if your visual modality is stronger than your, aud your auditory modality, which could be perception or sequencing, short term, lots of different things, motor kinesthetic, all, how they all act and react, interact and help or hinder the process of information. Would it be a wrong assumption to say that the student has a lesser degree of dyslexia? Mm -hmm. um, there are varying degrees. I, I, I've, <laughs> yes. So what, what would be, like if a student came into our office and they're having difficulty to say, what, what, what would be some of the things that would be well, a student, student coming to you is coming for a specific reason with some problem that they keep having, not just unfinished work. Is it getting their reading done? Is it getting their written assignments done and in on time? What, that's what you need to look at first. Unfinished? Unfinished or uh, work that isn't done correctly or they keep getting low grades on it and they don't understand why. What about students who take hours and hours uh -huh. to do something? Yep. Yeah. Would the, this would be a question for the ABA office? Yes, yeah, about the same. Yeah, and it wouldn't. It, it isn't necessarily dyslexia, but it isn't necessarily attention deficit. I'd rather rule out the dyslexia if they're not dyslexic, and I can tell. I can always tell because I've done this for so many years if it's primarily dyslexia with some attention issues, or is it attention? that's causing problems because they, they score, the test looks much different mm -hmm. when it's an attentional issue primarily. Would, would, say if we were to recommend a student to go visit with Terry and take a test, would the documentation qualify in the ABA office? That would be a good question. It has to be done by license. Yeah, I'm, and I'm not a psychologist. So that wouldn't qualify I will, I'm going to already have a note to ask Carl. Okay, I was going to ask stack you. my test up to any norm reference psychologist <laughs> <laughs> to tell you more. Yeah, I'm going to know that. One, that's going to be a great resource. Yeah, I've already got that. that yeah. One of my colleagues um, with the Slingerland Institute and friends is an adjacent, well, she was over the teacher ed department at uh, University of San Francisco. California, San Francisco, and now she's an adjacent, she teaches, but she did, uh, does a lot of psychology, uh, educational testing, and says the same thing. She said, I'll stack that Slingerland screening up to any other tests that I ever give, and they have to give them because they're norm referenced and you're comparing, but I've got a way of kind of getting a percentage out of the reading, so anyway, you can ask. So to ask for him as well, do you, when you release your results, do you give a list of accommodations? Yes, I students? do. Yes. Okay. That and be, that'll, I know that that would be. Key. I do know that I've sent a lot of um, younger students down to the Scottish, the Shriners, mm -hmm. Scottish Rites, mm -hmm. and they take their test and they look at it because they're familiar with it. So they mm -hmm. they look at that and they've actually referred a couple of students to the school that are in our area. So I know that they do look at it. So. I understand. Just one degree I've never wanted to get. <laughs> the Scottish Rite looks at the test results that have already been compiled, or they do the testing there? They do the testing there. Okay. But, but they take yours into consideration? Yeah, they take yeah. ours into, <laughs> into consideration. You have to get a recommendation to actually get that testing yes. done from your position. From your position. And even, yeah, that would be a even if you receive one of the other departments for physical, you still have to get a recommendation for that doctor to go over and get the testing done. Okay. I had to do it with my mom. Yeah. So and we had to kind of finish. With my junior high and high school students, what I've been working on, well, I've had three of them for four years. This is my third year with them now. But we start with um, first learning how to develop a sentence, well written, <laughs> then a well written paragraph. Now we're working on, we did. Um, Realizing also that research papers are much, actually much easier to write than something you're analyzing and you've read. It's much, really much, it's te more tedious, but it's much easier because there's a, 
a sentence, there's a structure that you can teach them for doing research papers that starting with an outline and note cards and plugging your information back into the outline, it makes it much easier um, for them to take that and turn those points in your outline into your paragraphs and sentences and your points. Um, so it's, it's really breaking it down into the little tiny tasks and building it up from there. That's what I do with my kids. And we're doing, um, in our literature book this year, I've got a variety of genres of stories in there, and they're having to, um, and they're having to write a summary with some good adjectives and stuff in there that we're doing some good paragraph development. They're having a lot more trouble doing that because it's, it's more um, out in the air and it's not always based on fact. It's based on how you feel that that character's, why that character's doing what he's doing in the story. So it's, it's a whole different type of, but it's all breaking it down into little tiny segments. And it's not easy when they get this far along and they're with you at this level and the, what's expected of them. And it really depends on what writing you're talking about because they're two different. Lit writing for uh, English class is totally different than writing for non-right-brained non class. Right. <laughs> Did that, there are um, apps and programs for helping organize graphic organizers or even good for those kinds of writing. Any graphic organizers are, are really good. And that's the nice thing about um, a lot, like Word and some, I mean, you can get, um, graphics organizer program that I used with one of my high school students I tutored. You plug in the information and it, you just type all these different things and it can make all kinds of different graphic organizers for you and I can't think of what it is now. I'll have to think of it. It's an app. There's a, there's an, I think there's an app like it but there's also a program. Oh, okay. I would think, think of an email. I will. But it was, it really helped her get over the hump that she needed for, she had the same problem as a little girl that finally graduated, took her four years to graduate from junior college, but she did it. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. How so, overlays help? Overlays, we, and, and Connie and Christy and I talked about this, um, overlays help because um, we're colored, using a different color paper other than white helps because um, the, we are in rooms with fluorescent light. I don't even like reading in a fluorescent lit room. I'd rather have the lights off in my classroom if there's light coming in the window than have the overheads on because the light flickers on an overhead and you're already having trouble reading and staying on, you know, especially if the print's little. So the, um, over, the overlay or the colored paper keeps the, this is what students have told me. I don't experience this, but this is what they've told me. It's easier because the letters aren't jumping around on the page. It keeps the letters from jumping around. I've experimented with a lot of different colors. The most pervasive colors are that real pretty blue and either buff or yellow seem to be the best. But overlays help some. And I've got a stack of Berlin lens overlays that one of my other teachers gave me. And I've only had one student that I knew, because I, we were, we were in the San Francisco Bay Area, we had all the, all the new stuff going on. Uh, Erlen lenses came through and they were a big thing. Well, one of the teachers on staff went and got trained as a pre-tester, and so we, we just screened everybody that was having problems writing and seemed to be severely dyslexic. Well, there was only one student in all the six years I was there that needed, that really benefited from Erlen lenses, and it really did improve his reading. He was still dyslexic, but that's one in how many. I mean, it's very, just very, very rare. Some of them would grab um, overlays because their eyes were tired. It does, black and white, is, it's hard to read on. You know, if you have an a e reader, most, I choose the gray or the kind of, yeah, sepia paper because it's, it's easier to read than that white and black. It's less tiring on your eyes. 